Coming up on Locked On Dodgers, no news for the Dodgers, but we'll take a look at the youth movement that's coming for the team in 2023, how their offseason fared in terms of war and players lost and players signed, and then talk about a little bit of a rumor that Araldis Chapman was going to be signed by the Dodgers that was quickly dispelled. That's what's on tap, so make sure to keep it Locked On Dodgers. You are Locked On Dodgers. Your daily Los Angeles Dodgers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yo, 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 Dodger fans, welcome to Locked On Dodgers. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, the number one local sports daily podcast network. Locked on, your team every day. This is the daily podcast covering the Los Angeles Dodgers, bringing you the smart fans' perspective on our boys in blue. We can be found wherever you find podcasts and on YouTube simply by searching for Locked On Dodgers. Make your life easier by subscribing in both those places so you'll never miss a day because you know we're not going to. If this is your first time listening watching, you're lucky. You get both of us today. I'm Vince Samperio. That's my co host, Jeff Snyder. And we are both lifelong Dodger fans that can. Cover the team currently, have covered the team in the past, been in the press box, been in the locker room, done a bunch of things surrounding the Dodgers. And one of those things is this podcast that we do for you guys every Monday through Friday for about 30 minutes covering the wide world of Los Angeles Dodger baseball and sometimes MLB baseball. And that's what we're here to do today. There was no news in Dodgerland. We're expecting news later today on Friday because the Dodgers have to decide uh, exactly what they're going to do with Trevor Bauer. Uh, But that episode will come on Monday. Today, we're going to look at the youth movement coming toward the Dodgers. Uh, you know, one of the biggest ones that we, we've anticipated in a while in terms of young, unproven in the major leagues uh, players getting significant playing time for the Dodgers. Uh, a little bit look at the offseason and in terms of players the Dodgers lost, players the Dodgers signed, and kind of where they can make up for that in terms of value. And then there was Carlos Baerga, who's broken some news this offseason, uh, was reporting that the Dodgers and Padres had both talked to Araldis Chapman, uh, but it was quickly dispelled on the Dodgers and that it wouldn't happen. But I guess we can take a look and see should the Dodgers be considering him. Uh, but that'll be at the end. So, yeah, with all that being said, Jeff, uh, how are you doing? And uh, I know you kind of had let we're going to leave the discussion here on the youth prospect movement type of conversation so yeah i'm doing pretty well except uh about an hour ago i saw in the comments of our youtube uh yesterday's episode that somebody said that i hate trevor bauer because i'm a, a boomer and uh i just want to clear the record that my parents were born seven years into the baby boomer generation i know i look old i was born in 1977 i'm old i'm grumpy i'm not a boomer I'm firmly Gen X, Degeneration X, as as we like to say. Uh, anyway, uh, you know, call me a boomer if you want. Just uh, uh, I, I was pleased to see that so many people took me up on my permission to disagree with things I didn't actually say, uh, but we did have a lot of good conversation in the YouTube comments too. So I appreciate all of you. Uh, but yeah, on this youth movement thing, I've been thinking a lot about this, and you know, we don't really know what the 2023 youth movement for the Dodgers is actually going to look like. We don't know. Like we're pretty sure that Miguel Vargas is going to be basically an everyday player. That's the plan for him. Beyond that, we don't really know. James Outman probably going to get some, some plate appearances. Michael Bush probably going to get some plate appearances. Bobby Miller and Gavin Stone probably going to debut at some point, but we don't really know when. So we don't know how much they're going to depend on the rookies, but there's a chance at least that they are going to depend quite a bit on rookies this year. And, uh, 2022 was an abnormally low year for rookies on the Dodgers. The Dodgers only had six rookies play for them at all in 2022. And five of them still have rookie status that because they played so little, the sixth one played even less, but uh, that was Jake Reed who, uh, because it was his second or third year in the big leagues, he exceeded the rookie limits. So Jake Reed is the only guy who was a rookie last year, who isn't again this year. The other ones are all, you know, Michael Grove, Andre Jackson, James Outman, Ryan Pepio, and Miguel Vargas. And all those guys are still rookies. So they add to this coming year. But six rookies in a whole year is very low, especially because just the year before that, the Dodgers had 20 rookies play for the team in 2021. 
And uh, it, it, but if you look at who they were, it wasn't a youth movement. It was a, everybody we have is hurt. And, you know, so yeah, we're going to throw Zach Rex at the wall for gonna, a little while. We're going to throw Luke Rayleigh at the wall for a little while. You know, they, so 20 different guys, but only like five or six of those guys are even still in the organization. And the only two who really made any impact on the team were Alex Vesia and Phil Bickford. Everybody else, it was, you know, a handful of appearances for Darian Nunez and a handful of like one appearance for Connor Green. I I forgot that Connor Green existed uh, until I, I saw that list. And, and but so I was looking through the how many rookies have played for the Dodgers each year, the last several years, and, and look at the specifics of who they were trying to find a rough equivalent for what this year could be, you know, when they actually depended on rookies. And we're going to talk more in the second segment about how the Dodgers are kind of depending on the rookies to fill some of the gaps with some of the free agents they lost. Uh, and, and I got back to 2006 and 2006 was an interesting year for the Dodgers because they had, uh, they had 15 rookies that year and there's some reasonably big names there. You know, Chad Billingsley pitched quite a bit for the Dodgers that year. Andre Ethier, and uh, Russell Martin both were basically starters that year as rookies. And uh, then you had Matt Kemp and uh, James Loney, uh, who only got, you know, between 100 and 200 plate appearances each that year, but went on to become mainstays of the Dodgers. And then in the bullpen, you had Hong Chi Kuo and uh, Takashi Saito, who were both rookies. Uh, oh, and Jonathan Broxton, too. And so it was a pretty impactful year for rookies that kind of set the tone for, you know, two years later, that team made the NLCS and then did it again the year after that. So yeah, that, that was a, a big year for a youth movement. And one of the big differences I see in this year's team is the supporting cast because that 2006 team, you had an old Nomar Garcia Parra, an old Jeff Kent, you know, an old Greg Maddox, like a lot of guys who used to be stars or used to be decent and were now past their prime. Uh, you know, even Rafael Fercal was a shortstop. He wasn't old, but he was he, he wasn't what he had been a couple years earlier. Uh and and this year, the Dodgers, you know, that, that team in 2006 didn't have a Freddie Freeman or a Mookie Betts. They didn't have a Clayton Kershaw or Julio Urias. Uh, they had, you know, aging kind of role players. Their best pitcher was probably Derek Lowe, who even at his best was never uh Derek Lowe at his best probably wasn't as good as Julio is right now. And Derek Lowe wasn't at his best anymore. And, and so it, it's kind of a, th there's an interesting parallel there though, at least to see that, you know, that 16 years ago and how that kind of laid the groundwork. And a lot of those guys, you know, were still there basically, uh, you know, Kemp and Ethier uh, were still there when this current stretch of 10 straight years of making the playoffs started you know russell martin was gone by then came back later uh james loney left right before that stretch started chad billings they've been gone for a little while Brock's been gone but uh you know they, they it kind of laid that groundwork and that foundation and, and i feel like a, a youth movement this year could kind of lay that same foundation without ever having to get bad just kind of okay we're going to in, infuse some youth into this and kind of lay the foundation for the next 10 years of this championship window that hopefully is never going to close. Yeah. And, and that's really where this transitions to um, because it, it's not, you know, they don't need these guys to come in and be MVPs or even all stars, you know, for definitely all stars. They just kind of need them to be above average in order for them to supplement the, talent that's already on the roster Mookie Betts Freddie Freeman Will Smith Max Muncy I mean those are four you throw in Chris Taylor those are five four guys five guys that have either been all-star worthy or all-stars in the past couple years Will Smith being the one that's been worthy and not the actual all-star so that's kind of what it lends itself into it but what we've noted you know what we've had the last few years you know the big one's going to come not necessarily in the form of a rookie but everyone else collectively helping out with like the loss of Trey Turner is not going to be filled by Gavin Lux. It's going to be filled by Gavin Lux and Miguel Vargas and, you know, James Outman or, or you know, Michael Bush, whoever else plays well. So that's what we're going to get into right now. But first, we're going to talk about Built Bar because this episode is brought to you by Built Bar. If you're looking for a delicious treat but don't want all the fat and calories, then you got to try a Built Bar. We've been pushing Built Bars for a while now. Jeff and I are both uh, active eaters of Built Bars and, 
you know, don't judge Bill Bars by that because, you know, they, they help out. Uh, you know, we could be a lot worse off if we weren't eating Bill Bars. So Bill Bars are there. They got low, low, low calorie, you know, low carb, high protein, high fiber. They got all the bad stuff that are they don't have the bad stuff to have all the good stuff. And they got a bunch of good flavors, churro, peanut butter, brownie, coconut, almond. They taste like candy bars. They're covered in 100 percent real chocolate and healthy can be tasty with built bars. And right now you don't have to order them online. You can go and get them at your store. Head to your nearest Walmart or Sam's Club and you can find built bars there. Go to the pharmacy section, grab yourself a box of built bars. They got four bar boxes. They got 13 bar boxes. Whatever you need, they got you covered right there. So if you're in Sam Clubs, run in and get a 13-bar box with brownie batter or churro and thank us after. So if you need something that's going to help you out this January, go get you a built bar. All right. Thank you for make, uh, late making Lockdown Dodgers your first listen of the day. Check out Lockdown MLB Prospects with Lindsey Crosby. He's a prospect encyclopedia, and he's going deep on the MLB stars of tomorrow. It's free and available wherever you get podcasts. All right, so continuing that conversation of the Dodgers and the youth movement and kind of where they need them to fill in, uh, Fangraphs put out an article on Thursday or no, on Wednesday saying that the title is The Dodgers Have Had a Strange Offseason. And it goes through and, you know, takes a look at the Dodgers offseason. And it goes through and, and specifically free agency and the amount of war the Dodgers lost and the amount of war they gained by free agents they signed. And the Dodgers lost the most war of any team in free agency, 21.3. The Yankees were second, uh, the biggest with 20.8. The biggest difference was that most of that was Aaron Judge, and the Yankees signed Aaron Judge back and then added Carlos Rodon on top. So they gained 20.3 war, which left them only negative 0.5. Whereas the Dodgers, their free agency, their free agents uh, added up to 6.9 war. So they're down negative or they're down 14.3 war net. That's the highest in the league. Uh, the next highest is the White Sox with 10.1. So the Dodgers, you know, did lose a lot of talent. Tyler Anderson, Trey Turner being, you know, one of the main ones, Andrew Heaney as well. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how much work at Kimball is worth, but I guess he's one of those ones as well. But where it comes in for the Dodgers is, you know, that the fan graphs also had the zips projections for the Dodgers and, for the first time in a while, you, you see them under under average in center field, under under average in left field, right over average at second base, which average usually for, for war is 2.0. Uh, they come in under 2.0 in outfield and just over 2.0 at second base. Uh, but the end of the article basically says, but, you know, you can definitely see the Dodgers winning 105 games and it might not even matter. Because that one of the reasons that might not matter is because of these young guys that can't fill in. So, you know, that war gained is just based on free agency, but it doesn't count a full season of Miguel Vargas and a full season of, you know, or full season or, you know, hundreds of at bats from Outman and Bush and other guys we talked about. So that's where it comes in. You know, that's where the Dodgers kind of need it. We've talked about the margins before. The Dodgers have guys that, that are, you know, all star caliber, like we already mentioned but they need these guys to come in and fill in and be average to above average in order for the Dodgers to still win 95 plus games. And if they're even better than that, then they might, you know, replicate the hundred, 105, maybe 110 wins that they did before. Maybe not that many, but either way, that's what the Dodgers need. And that's kind of the biggest difference between now and and the year you mentioned 2006 is, you know, this Dodgers are still expected to win. The 2006 team had some fun games and, you know, they, they had the four and one game, but they weren't necessarily expected to win. This team is still expected to be at the top of the NL West and close to the top of the National League. Yeah, and uh, you know the, the other thing that that doesn't necessarily take into account is the value they're going to get from even the free agents they have because that looks at last year's WAR for those guys. So Noah Syndergaard was less than one WAR last year. It's not crazy at all to expect a three WAR season from Noah Syndergaard this year. Uh, Dustin May is going to hopefully provide a lot more value this year than he did last year. Uh, but that doesn't count in that added war. Uh, you know, the, all, all those things, if Clayton Kershaw finds a way to make 26 starts instead of 22, like he has the last two years, that's added value. Uh, Shelby Miller came in and was, I assume, a zero war or negative war guy last year because while he struck out a lot of guys, he uh, 
he didn't have a yeah, it was negative 0.2 war. So if Shelby Miller has a good season in relief, puts up one war, you know, that that all adds to that. And and when you look at if they lost a net of 14.3, that puts them down about 96 or 97 wins because they won 111 games last year. That's the the thing to remember. And, and I feel like a lot of people are forgetting that that this team was historically good last year. And I, I know they lost in the postseason. I think that's why it's easy to forget how good they were. Uh, but they were legitimately a 111-win team last year. And so even if they lose 14 wins, that's 97 wins. And then we make up a handful with Syndergaard and, and you know, one or one with Miller and one with Kershaw and three with May. And, and you add all those up. And, yeah, it's not hard at all to picture this team winning 105 games. And uh, and the offseason's not over yet. They could definitely still do some stuff. But uh, everything – that the Dodgers get. If you look at 97 wins as kind of that baseline, then everything they get from a rookie is a bonus on top of that. Uh, and so James Outman, even if he's not great, if he is a solid, you know, two and a half win guy, that's two and a half more wins there. Uh, and better than what, you know, better than what Cody Bellinger provided last year. Uh, it, there's, there's so many different things. And, and that's the thing about this Dodgers team is, for as frustrating this offseason has been, it's a deep team. And Andrew Friedman is pretty good at putting together a baseball team. And so, you know, right now, yeah, we're not quite sure what the shortstop situation is going to look like. And I guess maybe they're really going to go with Gavin Lux as a starting shortstop uh, unless the trade market opens up. Um, we don't know what center field is going to look like, but the bullpen is going to be really good. The starting rotation, if they're healthy, they're going to be awesome. Even if they're not healthy, they have enough guys they can fall back on. They have five plan Bs, basically, uh, behind their five starters. So plenty of, of room to wiggle there. So it's uh, it's easy to be gloomy about this team because the offseason has been kind of blah. But uh, when you remember how good they were to start with, even after they lost that 21.3 war, it's uh, it's a pretty darn good team. Yeah, and, and it's you know, going to be tough because you just see what they lost and, you know, they didn't get any of the big names. And, you know, it, it realistically, it's not going to be as easy as, oh, they lost, you know, 14.3 war and that means they're going to lose 14 less games on the show 95 win team. You know, this team can go a few different ways and, and that's – it's exciting in a certain sense, not as exciting as, you know, having the benefit of knowing, you know, the Dodgers are going to win 100 games this year. Uh, but it's exciting in the fact that, you know, you get to see them kind of push through, fight through. And, and that's we've seen the teams that have had to do that the last few years. That's kind of the teams that have had some success. So maybe it leads to that success or maybe it doesn't. You know, we're never going to know. We're never going to you know, there's never there's no formula for sure to have it figured out. I can guarantee you the Phillies probably aren't going to make it back to the World Series and they added Trey Turner. So, you know, it, it, it's it's a lot of different things that goes on with with building a team. But like you said, for a team that lost. 21.3 war 14 the last 21.3 war to still be in the position that they're in just you know kind of shows what what this front office can do yeah for sure and the other thing that we haven't really talked about is you know we talked about dustin may but dustin may is not the only guy who they're going to get more value out of this year than they did last year max muncie was only good for half the season last year mookie betts even though he finished fifth in the mvp voting I think everybody agrees that Mookie Betts didn't have his best season. He set a career high in home runs, but he wasn't overly consistent overall. And so, you know, there's more that Mookie Betts can do. Gavin Lux uh, was before his neck injury, he was legitimately very good. And his overall season numbers end up looking kind of lackluster because he really struggled after the neck injury. But he, if he's healthy, he could be very good. J.D. Martinez is, you know, his war last year was 1.1. He's usually between three and six war. And so if he can bounce back even to the low end of that, um, it's really, oh, and Chris Taylor, obviously Chris Taylor was terrible last year. And, you know, he was on sports in LA the other night talking about the work he's been putting in talking about how, you know, I, I think I, he didn't really blame the elbow surgery, but I feel like that surgery probably got his mechanics messed up. And then he just never, he talked about how he's never able to find it, never able to fix it during the season. Cause it's hard to fix mechanics when you're playing every day. Uh, but he's had the off season to work on that. He's his elbows fully recovered. His foot's fully recovered. His neck is fully recovered all these nagging injuries he had. And so, you know, I mean, there there's, 
every position, even the, the spots filled by rookies, you could picture the Dodgers being somewhere between above average and among the best in baseball at, at all the positions, even if they're not projected to be, uh, that's because projections are conservative. And so, you know, James Outman isn't going to be projected to be great, but it's not hard to picture him being a good, solid, above average outfielder in the major leagues. And so there's uh, so much potential here. And obviously, as we've seen the last few years, plenty of potential for things to go wrong with injuries or ineffectiveness or whatever. And and that does make it more exciting. I, I am looking forward to a, a season that is a little bit more exciting, a little bit more drama. I, I still hope the Dodgers finish 20 games ahead of the Padres like they did last year and the year before. Uh, but I, I don't, you know, I don't necessarily expect it, uh, but I, I'm hoping for that. Uh, but if not, the consolation prize is a really exciting season, and that should be good too. Yeah. All right. We got one more topic left. Uh, actually, we'll, we'll throw on a little other part of the topic. But first, real quick, thanks for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen of the day every day. You can find us wherever you find podcasts and on YouTube. All right, Jeff, before we talk about Raldis Chapman, uh, there was a little note. It didn't ne- doesn't necessarily pertain to the Dodgers. It might not, but there was a note from John Heyman, a.k.a. Scott Boris, that Carlos Correa's camp has talked to at least one other team other than the Mets as they continue to work the language and figure out what kind of deal they're going to do there. Um, you would imagine that that other team is maybe the Twins, but you know, there's also hope that it might be the Dodgers or maybe Scott Boris is, you know, trying to get the trying to put. It's probably more of them trying to push the Mets into making a deal. But the fact that there's a very little sliver of imagination for the Dodgers there just makes it intriguing to the at least a little bit. Yeah, for sure. We you know, no point in giving up on the the idea of Carlos Correa until he actually signs. A contract somewhere and finds a way to pass a physical uh and yeah and it may come down to the fact that he may not be able to pass a physical w- well enough that anybody's willing to give him 10 or more years and if it does get down to where he's looking at a five or six year contract you know the dodgers could be back in play especially if they decide you know i feel like correa is the kind of guy if they i don't know how accurate the reports are that they're shying away from him for fear of fan backlash uh, if that's the case, they're not going to be in on them no matter what. But if they uh, aren't worried about that and are just looking at the payroll, I think Correa is the kind of player you go over the luxury tax for if you can get it on a short-term deal, short-ish term, term deal. Uh, I'd be totally comfortable giving Correa six years, even with the fact that he apparently only has one leg or whatever it is that's holding up to physical. Uh, he's the best shortstop in baseball. And uh, I don't like the guy, but uh, – I think he's good and he's going to play for somebody. So it might as well be my favorite team. Yeah. So like I said, we'll continue to monitor that, but realistically it's probably more so just movement on Boris's side, but either way. All right. The other bit of rumors that uh, was out there, Carlos Baerga, who broke the Verlander to the Mets and broke the Rafael Devers contract extension. He's also been wrong on a few things so far this off season. Seems like he's wrong again. He posted on his Instagram that Araldus Chapman was rumored to be offered a two-year deal by the Dodgers and the Padres. Don't know about the Padres end of things, but Mike D. Giovanna uh, from the LA Times, he tweeted today uh, that the rumors about Araldus Chapman are not true. Two sources familiar with teams thinking say LA is not involved in the bidding for the embattled left-hander. Uh, This conversation does come on, like I said, on the heels of the Trevor Bauer decision. Um, But yeah, Jeff, I mean, the Dodgers almost got Chapman before when he was good. I don't imagine. And before we knew of anything with him and and his personal life. Now they know about both of those things or now they know about that. And he's not good anymore. Is there any reason the Dodgers would even be thinking about Aralda Chapman? If he was a different player without the off-field issues, I could see him being the kind of player they might be interested in because he's a guy who used to be legitimately great, still has decent stuff, not as good a stuff as he used to have, but still has stuff you can work with. And so I could see the Dodgers, uh, what I call the Dodgers school of pitchcraft and wizardry. Um, I could see them taking a flyer on a guy like Chapman, not Chapman specifically, but a guy like him. Uh, but the fact that it is Aroldis Chapman who 
this very same ownership group has already one time said, no, we're not interested in this guy because of the off-field stuff. Uh, it right now of all times doesn't seem like the time when they would uh, change their tune on that when they did just, you know, maybe not bid on Carlos Correa because of, you know, baggage when they're dealing with trying to figure out what to do with Trevor Bauer because of his baggage, all that stuff seems like a weird time to bring in baggage, uh, especially because he does have the name recognition of a world as Chapman. So maybe would uh, get paid more than they'd be looking for, for a reclamation project anyway. Uh, yeah. It, it's a rough day for Carlos Baerga. He had one day in the sun after he was the guy to break the Rafael Devers extension news, got his glory. And then he's back to, you know, Aaron judges going to the Giantsville uh, and back in the lost column for Carlos Baerga. Uh, yeah. I wonder what his mustache looks like these days. I haven't seen a picture of him lately. He had a sweet mustache back in the nineties. And uh, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, it's hard for me to see a world as Chapman being a fit on this Dodgers team. Yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't make sense, and you know, we, especially I talked because about the rele- bullpen's actually one of their strengths. Yeah, so. and yeah, I mean, I talked about relievers the other day, and there he wasn't even in top five or whatever left on four from the last two seasons. I didn't even remember him. he's a free agent. I didn't, you know, wasn't really thinking about him. So, it really doesn't make sense. There's only a couple guys in free agency that do make sense for the Dodgers, especially when it comes down to the bullpen, just based on what they have already. So, yeah, you can't see it happening. But, uh, you know, Carlos Baird, maybe the Padre, maybe that's still – maybe he's right on half of it. He still could be right on half of it, I guess. Um, yeah. The Dodgers – or the Padres, speaking of the Padres, were also in the mix for Johnny Cueto, them and the Marlins, both vying for Johnny Cueto. Uh, an interesting word to use for a guy like John Cueto since, I know, I don't think the bidding war is going very high. It's just a matter of, you know, who gives him an extra 500000 probably. Yeah, uh, and the Padres did sign Wilmer Font. I don't know if you saw that. He's yeah. been in Korea the last two years. So, uh, yeah, apparently it's a minor league deal, but uh, the, the, he pitched pretty well in Korea. So, as a starter, 53 starts over the last two years, had like a 305 ERA. So, you know. Cross our fingers that Wilmer Font is in the Padres rotation. That would be good news for the Dodgers. Yeah. Um, all right, Jeff, we, we're done a little bit quicker than normal, but you got anything else you want to add? I just have one last hypothetical question for you. Do you think there's any chance, and this will be old news by shortly after uh, people listen to this probably, but on the Trevor Bauer front, you know, we, we everybody's been assuming either he's on the team in 2023 or they release him today. Uh, there's a third option. Well, that actually there's two other options. They could trade him today. Or I wondered if there's any chance because right now there's no, not much motivation for any team to trade for him because if the Dodgers are going to release him, he's going to be free agent soon anyway. And uh, you know, th- there's kind of a motivation if a team like the pirates wanted him because Trevor Bauer, when he hits free agency, isn't going to sign with the pirates unless they're the only team interested. And so the pirates best chance of getting Trevor Bauer would be to trade for him, but other teams that uh, might be interested in him. I wonder if the Dodgers, because the Dodgers could cut him at any time, you know, so all they have to do by today is put him on the 40 man roster, which would mean cutting somebody else. And uh, you know, there's Justin Brule, there's Yanni Hernandez or somebody who, you know, isn't likely to pay, play a huge part for the team. Anyway, they could cut somebody, put Bauer on the 40 man roster, which then any team that is interested in him, would actually have to motivate them to to look into making a trade and maybe taking on some of that salary. Do you think they could play some of that game, play chicken with them, with other teams, knowing they, they could still release Bauer at any point anyway? Uh, but could you see them doing that? I don't – I'm. it's definitely something they've thought about. Uh, I think it's one of those where – if you don't plan on him pitching for you in 2023, then that's a ri- like kind of an unnecessary risk um, in terms of like PR hit. You know, if they don't care about the PR hit, you know, there's, you know, it, it's sad to say, but there's a lot of other things going on in the sports world right now, you know, even specifically NFL wise. So, you know, the Friday news dump is Friday news dump for a reason. And if that was, you know, the way they wanted to go about it, it would cause ripples among Dodger fans, but it probably wouldn't really cause ripples around the entire sports world. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I can't see that happening just for the fact, like I said, if he's not going to pitch for you, then it, it makes more sense to just cut bait while you can. But you know, it, it's, 
there's one person I would try to would be Andrew Friedman and, and, you know, trying to not necessarily a loophole because it's not a loophole. It's, you know, something that it would be a strategy in that sense. Uh, but yeah, I, I, it, it, you can't have reports out there that you don't want to sign Carlos Correa and then, you know, keep Trevor Bauer for the, try to get some like, you know, prospect for him or something. Yeah. Yeah. I assume this is an ownership decision more than a Friedman decision because they're the ones who own the brand. They're the ones who, the, you know, any PR hit, any, all, all that stuff, it affects the owners more than the general manager. And so I imagine it's Mark Walter and, and those guys making this decision. But yeah. We'll see what it is. And uh, yeah, I assume we won't talk about it till Monday, but I guess if it's a uh, big enough news, maybe we do a weekend episode if there's something crazy that happens, but uh, otherwise we'll talk about it on Monday. Yeah. Yeah. So that's it for today's episode. Thank you all for listening. Thank you for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen. Check out Locked On MLB Prospects. Host Lindsey Crosby is going deep on the MLB stars of tomorrow, some of which might be the Dodgers. So go check it out, Locked On MLB Prospects, wherever you get podcasts, and on YouTube, which is also where we are, wherever you get podcasts, and on YouTube. You can also find us on social media, Twitter and Instagram, at Locked On Dodgers. Jeff is on Twitter at Snydog. I'm at Vince Samperio. DMs are open on all those accounts if you need to get a hold of us. You can also get a hold of us via email, lockedondodgers at gmail.com or via voicemail text at 323-863-5625. We're here every weekday morning, and we hope you'll be with us when you get in your car or if you're at home. Terry Smart Device Play Podcast, Locked On Dodgers. And remember, you don't have to agree. You just have to listen. Have a good one. We'll talk to you on Monday.